today. Our exhortation will be provided by our brother Jason Larson, and his title is Standing in the Gap. In preparation for his remarks, he's asked that we read from Ezekiel chapter 18. That for you here. So it's Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, What meaning that they use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth shall die. But if a man be just and do what is lawful and right... And hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man hath walked in my statutes and have kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any of these things, and that doth not eat, doth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes into idols, hath committed abominations." hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He shall, he hath done all these abominations, and he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Now, lo, if he beget a son, and seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for his iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. Yet say ye, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked shall die, saith the Lord God, and not that they should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man shall doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed. And in his sin, he that sinned in them shall die. Yet ye say the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them, For his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. And again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore I will judge you. O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, 
saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why shall ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn unto yourselves and live ye. All right, at this time, if we could turn our attention to our brother Jason Larson, and again, his title is Standing in the Gap. Pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Pretty heavy. So, source of this exhortation, if you're interested in sources, it, it comes from our family Bible readings, which is a great source, as many brothers will say, of most of their exhortations. Uh, a while back, we had switched from um, the Robert Roberts plan to doing a chronological plan, and we purchased um, special Bibles that had everything lined out here. And so were, they were a source of books and chapters that ranged from Ezekiel and Jeremiah all together crammed in. And so we got to read the flavor of what was going on all at the same time. And there is um, a theme in here in Ezekiel 22. And I've got it in a couple different versions. So let me, let me go first with the NIV, then I'll go with the King James, and I'll go with the International Standard Version. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. King James has it this way. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. International Standard Version says, I sought for a man among them to build and repair the wall, to stand in the breach in my presence on behalf of the land so that it wouldn't be destroyed. But I found none. In Ezekiel 22 verse 30 here, same types of behaviors are listed in the, in the whole previous chapter there, right? Repent, turn from your offenses, then the sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why would you die, people of Israel? So standing in the gap, what does that mean anyway? How do you stand in the gap and why does God think that this is an important thing to do? Well, Standing in the gap means to expose oneself for the protection of something, something else, to make a defense against any assailing danger, to take the place of a fallen defender or supporter. In order to understand what standing in the gap means in the spiritual sense, we need to understand how it's portrayed in the physical sense first. So picture this city filled with people and buildings. Picture a wall of bricks and mortar that surround that city, and it's there to protect the inhabitants from external dangers. Picture an army now, advancing against that city, looking to kill, seek, and destroy all within that city. Picture areas of that wall that surround the city, broken down, and now how the enemy directs its attention on these places, these weaknesses, these vulnerabilities, so we can have access to the city. Now, picture a lone man standing in the gap in the wall. He's preparing to fight. He's preparing to fight the enemy on behalf of the city. There's a story of a Spartan king. His name is Leonidas. To show you how effective defending a small gap can be, think of him. For there were 200,000 soldiers coming against this Greek city of Sparta. And in a small gap, there are 300 men, Greek men, who defend the last man with such terrible bloodshed that the army is turned away. 
and one man survives. That's standing in the gap. Picture Noah and his family, surrounded by an ark made of planks of gopher wood, and the gaps are all filled in with pitch. Joining two pieces of wood together, working like mortar. Picture the hand of God taking the large gap in the wall of the ark, closing it with his hand and sealing it. Picture a flood of death and water, destruction coming upon that ark, millions of fingers looking for gaps in the ark to flood the ark and bring it to a watery destruction. That's standing in the gap. Now picture you. You're surrounded by knowledge of God's word. You're surrounded by a strong moral conduct. You're surrounded by acts of service, justice, love, mercy. You're surrounded by your brothers and sisters in the brotherhood. And picture a godless world of hate and destruction and immorality pressing down on you, crouching at your door. And now, picture your own weaknesses, whatever they may be. Picture that gap that exposes you, exposes your family, exposes your children, exposes your ecclesia. What is it that that opening allows the destruction of the world to freely flow in. It could be anything like uh, worldly distractions of TV or internet or gambling or pornography or hate or jealousy or lie or pride, ego, depending on things such as money, education, not on God, following false gods such as fame or power or riches. It could be an unbelief or a lack of faith. That gap could be neglect of personal faith misusing religion for your own purposes. That gap could be oppressing others, having anger and resentment, being unforgiving, having prejudice or injustice. The list is virtually endless, isn't it? But it's often summed up in 1 John 2, 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life does not come from the Father, but from the world. So identifying the gap or gaps that exist Allow to focus on a particular need that you might have. Now, picture a brother or sister. Maybe it's your spouse who knows of these gaps in your character, standing there with you, fighting off the arrows that come your way. Hmm. An example in the natural world can be found in the book of Nehemiah. See, Nehemiah was given permission from the Persian king to go and rebuild Jerusalem. And when he got there, he walked around, his head hung down. Because as he looked at the city of Jerusalem, he saw monstrous gaps. It was a symbol of what? The condition of the people themselves, the moral decay that had occurred, the lack of spirituality, the lack of godliness. Jerusalem's wall was a symbol of her people. In some ways, it's an example of us, isn't it? Our own spiritual lives and the destroyer in whatever form it wants to take waits for that opportunity to get through the gap. So what's the solution? It's a pretty big problem. How do we rebuild and repair and fix these gaps? How do we do that? Well, Nehemiah also has a bit of an indication for us there, too. In Nehemiah 4, it says, The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall, and those carried materials, did their work with one hand, and held a weapon with the other, and each of these builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. Yeah. So the spiritual analogy is unmistakable. Our goal is the same as theirs. Provide a protective barrier from the destroyer that crouches at the door, right? The means to address that end goal is also similar. Effort with the help of those that have the same goal. So 
Sometimes we read in scripture that the destroyer is God himself. I have three examples for you. Think of Abraham as he pleads with God for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And by implication, his left you not, Lot. There is Abraham standing in the gap. Think of Jonah as he travels through Nineveh, preaching repentance to a people he loathed, reluctantly standing in the gap. God said to Moses in Exodus 32, Therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. Psalms fills in the gaps here and says, therefore, he said he would have destroyed them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Think of the outcomes of these men who stood in the gaps. Sometimes in recession is successful. Sometimes it's not. In the time of Israel and Judah's destruction by God, he says to Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 22, 30, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap. So I wouldn't destroy it, but I found no one. I found no one. So what does that verse mean to us? I think maybe there are two ways that you can take that. How you can figure out how you can stand in the gap. One way is through prayer. The other way is through action. One, we must pray effectively like Moses did for others who are in need of help, but who are unwilling or unable to pray for themselves. When we do this, we are standing in the gap for them. These prayers are oftentimes on behalf of somebody else. They're deep and meaningful, not superficial. And they're designed to strengthen what's lacking. The other action, we must act with purpose. Like the future king David did for the Israelites or the soldiers in Nehemiah's time who protect these buildings and walls. We must stand alongside our brother ready for spiritual battle. We must recognize the danger. We must try and be fearless and see what Elijah saw. What did Elijah see? He saw more than his servant. In 2 Kings 6, it says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered, as they are there surrounded by the enemy. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God's army was there. There's a religious blogger that uh, I read sometimes. Her name is Karen Barber. She was talking about uh, different ways that you can pray for people. Uh, it's a difficulty that I have, so I need uh, help kind of giving me direction, right? Uh, what I can do oftentimes. Because um, unlike you guys, I'm pretty selfish, and, uh, and, I, and I think mostly of myself, so I, I need help in that regard. So she says, praying for those in a crisis situation who don't know God or who may not know how to pray or who don't even believe in prayer. That's a good thing that you can do to pray for and help somebody standing in the gap. Praying for those who are living in opposition to God through their unhealthy lifestyle, pride, or rebellion. That's one way you can stand in the gap, by praying. Praying for communities, institutions, churches, workplaces, where factions are battling for control. That's another way. Praying for those who don't believe in God or who are angry at God or who are actively denouncing faith or religion. Pray for them in that way, stand in the gap. Pray for the weak or the Ill, Ill or the downtrodden or the oppressed who cannot pray for themselves. Praying against evil and for the coming of God's kingdom. 
Pray for those going through the streets, stress of a major life crisis, whose mental energy may be drained to the point where they are unable to pray for themselves. These are good examples. Good examples. One of the greatest examples I know of, standing in the gap of prayer, comes from Daniel chapter 9. If you would, turn with me, Daniel chapter 9. We'll start at verse 2. In the, first of his reign, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word the Lord had given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I, I turned to the Lord God, and I pleaded with him in prayer and in petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and in ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God, and I confessed, and this is Daniel, a righteous man, very righteous man, who says, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. And we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. So here, Daniel standing in the gap. Not that he will save the nation because, well, he, he can't, but that they would repent and live he figuratively stands beside his brothers and prays for them. Ezekiel 14 says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply and to send famine upon it and kill its people and their animals, even if these men, these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. So what does Daniel do? He can't save them. He prays that God will open their eyes and unstop their ears so that they will hear God's word, so that they will see and that they will understand what God wants and they will act with works fitting of repentance. He prays that they would be like the man in our opening reading, turning from their evil ways. In this way, the gaps in their own spiritual lives will be filled with God's brick and mortar filled with godly stones. But blindness and deafness, um, it, it works both ways. When our lives are out of sync with God, he can shut his eyes and his ears towards us. We see this from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. So that all is a backdrop for what we're gonna read in Isaiah 59 and 58. Isaiah 58 says, for day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. See, 58, just before all that, God is laying into them through Isaiah. He says, you have no idea what true fasting is. You have no idea what it means to humble yourself. You think repentance is one thing, but it's not. You don't know how to act with truth and with love. You can't remember my Sabbath. And you have no idea how to cry out to me and petition me. You must confess your sin and repent. That's the backdrop of 58. And 59 continues on. 
the, the, the assault against the, the people is pretty clear. Hands are full of blood stain, and they should be there to protect and defend. Fingers are full of guilt, and they should be there to, to follow through and act and help people. Lips are full of eyes when God is expecting honesty, lies, instead of honesty. The tongue is making wicked sounds instead of praise to God. The voice, nobody's calling for justice, but God wants you to call for justice. Just full of emptiness. Verses 5 and 6, you can see and bring forth, vi forth sin, which are viper's eggs. And your covering for yourself is like a cobweb. Your hands act of violence, your feet rushing to do evil. Your walk is crooked and without peace. And your mind is continually on evil. Think of the time of Noah. All the darkness and wickedness. Verse 14, it says, justice is driven back and it stands at a distance. Justice is driven back, standing at a distance. Justice is not standing in the gap. God saw that there was no one to intervene. And so he said, my own arm is going to have to work salvation. He put on righteousness as his breastplate, his helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And now the key that brings us to the point. Isaiah 59 verse 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. So I have some questions. Who is this Redeemer? Who is this that stands in the gap in a way that we so desperately need? Who is this ark of our salvation? Who pleads for us in the wilderness? And who is this that will stand before giants? Who is going to help us build godly walls, standing with a sword by his side? Who prays for us? with groanings that cannot be uttered. Hmm. No, we look every bit like the people in Isaiah 58 and 59. Who's going to stand in the gap for us? Who would die while we are yet sinners? Ezekiel 22, For I sought a man among them to rebuild and repair the wall and stand in the breach in my presence on behalf of the land so that there wouldn't be destroyed but I found none. 59.16, it says, he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene, and so his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. So God provided one, a helper for those who try to stand in the gap and fail. As we sing, when other helpers fail, comforts flee, Help of the helpless, abide with me. So Christ does. For those of you who participate in the Sunday school class, the um, last couple of weeks have uh, pinned a bit of this, and uh, Kyle talked a little bit about this this morning, so uh, it's a precursor to what you're about to hear now. In Hebrews chapter 7, it says, there have been many of these priests since death prevented them from continuing office in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs, it says in 26. One who is holy, blameless, and pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sin and then for the sin of his people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. What a picture. So close your eyes for a second and I want you to picture this. There you are standing in the gap in the wall with your meager weapons, your righteousness, which is like filthy rags. 
You see the hordes of advancing troops looking to destroy you and your little city. How can you withstand the onslaught? Will you be trampled down, beaten and lifeless? You turn, and who's beside you? A man in white raiment. He's got a flashing sword by his side, a belt of truth buckled around his waist, a breastplate of righteousness in place. His feet are fitted with readiness. He has a shield of faith, which he can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And he wears a helmet of salvation and has the sword of the spirit. And he says, take these. They will help. And I'll help too. So we take a lot from Jesus, don't we? To help us fight. But he freely gives it. God wants us to win and be victorious. To fight a good fight. They know we need help. A simple reminder of this help sits before us at the table right ahead of us. We see bread and wine when we see, when we feel alone in the gap, we are to remember them. When we are embattled, our flesh beaten and our spirit bloodied, he is there with us. Do you see him 